So you didn't win nationals. That's what I want to talk about in this video. Uh, every year, obviously, only a certain number of people win the national championship tournament, and different formats of debate have a different number of nationals. Obviously, if you're in college LD, it's basically, did you win the NFA national tournament? In Parley, did you win NPTE and did you win NPDA? Uh, in high school, did you win TOC versus did you win NSDA? All these kinds of things in policy, there's like 10 of them in college, like ADA, CETA, NDT, etc. But the bottom line is, counting up all those tournaments, high school, college, and whatnot, something like, I don't know, 15, 20 entries, meaning uh, either partnerships or individuals, are going to win national championships in their various debate formats this year. And that means the thousands of other people who did not win the national championship this year um, will obviously walk away to a certain degree um, unsatisfied because if you didn't win the national championship tournament, then obviously there was something you could have theoretically done better and all of those kinds of things. And the reality of it is, uh, you know, I lost, I've mentioned this a bunch of times because why wouldn't I, but I've lost a lot of national semifinal rounds at this point uh, when I was a competitor in parliamentary debate. And you would probably think that if you're a student who, you know, maybe you didn't break at nationals or you lost in double octafinals or the first ELIM and whatever your format might be, you might feel like, yeah, but if I had made it to quarters or if I had made it to semis or if I had made it to the final round and then lost, then I would still, you know, at least feel okay about it. I just, I didn't get far enough along in the tournament to be satisfied with the result that I had. But from my personal perspective, it's not like making it to semis felt better than losing at some earlier point. There were some national tournaments where I did worse than I did uh, those years. And so what I'm really trying to speak to in this video is once you have failed to win the national championship tournament, which is just about all of you, pretty much everyone, but like Brenna and Tristan, this video is not for you. Go watch another one. Um, once you have accepted the fact that you have not won the national championship tournament, that you will not be a national champion this specific year. The question that a lot of students have is now what? And I'll hear this from my community college students, I'll hear this from university students, I'll hear this from high schoolers, middle schoolers on the internet, all that kind of stuff, where they're sort of like, uh, in some cases, they feel like it was all a waste. They feel like all the effort and the work that they put in wasn't ultimately worth it. And in other cases, they just feel motivated, right? They feel pretty excited to do the work. And I kind of want to speak to both of those things, but I actually want to start with that second idea, which is that some people after the national championship tournament, when they lose, let's say maybe they made it to SEMS or quarters or whatever, their takeaway, assuming they still have eligibility left the following year is this is so awesome. I was so close to winning. And if I had just done these one or two things differently, uh, I would do way better next year. And like next year, I've got a real shot at winning the whole thing. And so uh, I'm just really excited to get to work. I'm really excited to cut new files, figure out what the new topic is, work on this new skill set, figure out my new partner, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And the problem in almost all of those instances is those people are only motivated in the sort of like afterglow of the national tournament because it felt like they were really close. Maybe they just barely missed out or maybe they lost out by more than they sort of recognize, but it's incredibly easy to be motivated right after the national championship tournament if you did pretty good and to tell yourself, well, I'm gonna do all this work and I'm gonna commit to being better and I'm gonna sort of figure out all these different elements. But for the vast, vast majority of people, that's not gonna happen. What's gonna happen is a day or two later, you're gonna be super burnt out. You're gonna be trying to figure out the rest of your schooling or your job or your significant other, your life, your family, all of these things. And then you're just gonna kind of go back to what it was you were doing previously, right? Probably roughly the same amount of work that you did. Um, you might even be less motivated realistically because maybe you do get some sort of like psychological satisfaction from having done as good as you did. But the bottom line is, uh, it's much harder to stay motivated the further you get away from that really big experience. Now, the second camp of people, obviously, are the individuals who aren't motivated at all and who feel like quitting, who feel like giving up, who feel like it wasn't worth their time, all the effort they put in. And I find that that is sort of an equally self-defeating perspective on the issue because if the only thing you're considering in debate and in your career in terms of whether it was valuable, whether it was worth your time and whatnot, is 
if you win the national championship, then by God, are you going to be disappointed pretty much every single year? Because the reality is it's very difficult, obviously, to win the national championship. You have to be the best or at least one of the very best teams or individuals in the country. And then on top of that, a lot of stuff has to go your way, right? You have to get sort of the right judges for you, the right cases. Your opponent has to be on a certain level and you have to be on a certain level, all of these various things. And I know that students hear these things and never take them to heart. They never think that it's like actually the truth. But when your coaches and when the people who were in this activity before you tell you that when they look back, they don't really think about winning nationals or being in semifinals or whatever. What they think back on is the time they spent with their teammates, the time that person fell in the snow or had never seen the snow for the first time, the first time someone went outside of their home state, the first time someone was on an airplane. Um, hanging out in hotel rooms, playing silly games, getting good team dinners with people, the time you got really sick, the time you did something really stupid. These really are the things that stick with you uh, after this. And so if the only thing you're thinking about is winning or losing, you're not gonna have a very good time. But with that said, if I had a student, and I've had this happen before, but if I had a student come to me uh, after the national championship tournament and they felt like, they didn't get the result that they wanted and they still had some eligibility left. I think the things that I would primarily tell them in terms of like what to do, what can they do about it, all that sort of stuff, what should they work on? Um, I think the, the sort of top things that I would tell these people is in my opinion, at the end of the day, the thing that's gonna determine if you improve or if you don't improve is what you focus on. And when I say what you focus on, I don't mean like, oh, I'm focusing on reading Lacan or I'm focusing on uh, Nietzsche. What I mean is people have different approaches with regards to improvement. Some people think that all you should do is figure out what your weaknesses are and then make those less of a weakness. Uh, this is kind of the concept of like lopping off your C game or your D game, okay? Making sure that you're consistently uh, debating near your higher level or at least sort of average or above average compared to below average, because obviously our performance varies from round to round. The opposite school of thought is that instead of focusing on our weaknesses at all, we should just work on cultivating our strengths, that we should just ignore our weaknesses, we should work on developing uh, our own personal strengths, the thing that we're already good at, and then use that to sort of like, I don't know, bludgeon people over the head with it and, and, and win rounds in that sense. And I think that the real issue students have is less so figuring out if they should work on their weaknesses or work on their strengths, but rather figuring out why are people better than you? And that is a very strange concept for some people, because to me, if I were to look at my weaknesses as a competitor from my time, uh, I, I read too much defense. I wasn't really the best speaker. Um, until my senior year, I wasn't especially fast and I improved on a number of those things. And on some of those things, I still wasn't, you know, the best or anything by the end of it. But the reason that Tom Katie was like kicking the crap out of us regularly in debates had very little to do with whether Tom Katie was like a super good speaker or not. And was like ultra persuasive. Um, and Tom was definitely faster than me, but he wasn't like the fastest debater in the country. He was much more efficient. And what I started looking at when I was trying to analyze Tom game, Tom's game or when I was trying to analyze other people who I thought were better than me's game uh, was really just like, what was it they were doing or what was it they seemed to know that I didn't and how could I incorporate those things into my ability? Uh, and so I spent, I mean, just a ridiculous amount of time in the sort of like tape room or whatever on YouTube, watching videos, listening to recordings, going through flows where I had debated these people uh, and thinking about where did I see vulnerabilities in their game? Because the, the reality was that in the sort of like status quo, for lack of a better word, they were clearly finding success in something that I wasn't accounting for, but they certainly weren't perfect debaters, right? Other people could potentially beat them or had strengths that worked against them. And, and historically, there's always been teams within circuits who beat teams that theoretically they have no business beating. And so an example, like Washburn BK was one of the best teams in the country. They won nationals uh, when I was a student. They were also national finalists the year before. And they were just an insanely good team. But 
most of the time when they would debate Oregon, Oregon would win. And it felt strange because like Oregon, obviously Ali was very good and whatnot, but they just had like their number. There was something about the way that they approached debating that let them beat this team that on paper should be better than them in like a vast majority of scenarios. And so what I started thinking about when I was sort of seeing that play out was like, okay, well, who is beating Berkeley KL in the rounds? They are losing. Why are they losing? And I remember um, kind of similar to this when um, UT Tyler CH used to have, even though they were in Parley, like a disclosure doc where they publish like publicly for people. Here is who we debated, here's what the resolution was, here's what the strap we went for was, what the collapse was, and here's if we won or lost. And there was one year where they lost like three debates. Uh, and I looked at it and it was fascinating because like every single debate they lost, except for the very last one of their careers together, was on condo. Like every single time they lost to different teams was on conditionality bat. And I was like, well, that's a really strange kind of area, but it, it just seemed like, okay, even this team that is, they at that time had the highest win rate of any team ever. Uh, I think Brennan and Tristan now will have that after this year, but they had the highest win rate of like any team ever. But the one area where people were finding weaknesses against them, and these weren't even teams that were like really in the same ballpark as them on a competitive level. It wasn't like the second best team in the country. They were just beating them on condo. There was some area where there was weakness. And, you know, we lost to Berkeley all the time, and especially KL. And I, I don't want to say that, like, well, this, we just have this foolproof strategy for beating them. But I've mentioned before that, like, what we used to our advantage the last time we debated KL when we beat them at Nationals and eliminated them was they had beaten us so much, and they were always beating us using Buddhism. And senior year, even though we had what we felt were really good answers to their Buddhism shell— uh, we just didn't read them during any regular season tournament. We waited until elims of nationals, and then we broke it out. We were able to win the round, right? And, you know, we caught them by surprise and whatnot. But what I really was thinking about in this moment was, and I felt that Berkeley kind of had this weakness in general as a team sort of during this period, they would read the same stuff all the time, right? They would read this very similar diss ads. They would read the very similar case. They would read very similar theory. And their collapses were very similar. And I have a video somewhere on the channel of um, Amanda, who's one of the, the best Berkeley debaters, uh, doing MGs at two different national tournaments, I think the finals of both tournaments actually, different against different teams on different topics, where like 80% of the first several minutes of the speech are identical, where I've matched up, like here's exactly where they said this in the last debate too. And even though they were overwhelmingly dominant, both that team with Amanda and Ryan and, and also that team uh, with Tom and Henry and with Tom and... Uh, Thomas, I don't know why it was so hard to remember the other Tom's name, uh, and, and, you know, Brian and Henry to a certain extent, and, and Brian and Amanda, like, these teams read the same arguments all the time. And yes, that meant they were very, very well prepared and rehearsed on them, and so that was an advantage they had, similar to, like, when you're the affirmative in LD or the affirmative in policy, and you've read the same thing all year. But it ultimately, despite being, like, a strength for them, became a weakness in the sense that it was exploitable and it was something that you could plan around and something that you could effectively use to at least catch them uh, once or twice. And it didn't mean that, like, oh, we were suddenly better than Berkeley KL in this final round, but it meant we could beat them. And I guess what I'm trying to say is that I think there's a big difference between having to become better than other people to beat them in debates or just identifying the thing that they have a flaw with and that you can exploit. And those typically aren't things where you're going to beat them every single time you debate them, but like you don't necessarily debate them all the time. There are certain rounds that are more important than others, and you can kind of make these tactical decisions. Um, I acknowledge hugely that me and Dallas, one of our biggest flaws, and we knew this the whole time, but other people didn't want to take advantage of it, was read a counter plan against us that is unconditional. We were terrible at beating people who were unconditional because our strat against most counter plans we saw, because people would read... Uh, conditional counter plans against us was we would just read condo and we'd go for it and like whatever we're ready to throw down on condo let's have a good time there weren't very many teams in the country that were better than us at condo or that had practiced condo more than us and so it felt really good but there were a few teams usually from lewis and clark interestingly enough who didn't it didn't seem as far as i'm aware that they knew this but they just coincidentally would read like one-off counter plans against us like a single counter plan and a diss ad or whatever and we lost like every single one of those debates, regardless of who we were debating, regardless if we were theoretically better than them uh, and whatnot. And so what I would challenge you to do is less so think about what is your weakness, what is your strength, but instead to think about what is this other team finding success in and is there a degree to which you can exploit that thing? And I think that one of the really cool things about 
Lincoln-Douglas debate, policy debate, debates where there's uh, disclosure and where teams read the same cases fairly regularly is that you're kind of playing this like cat and mouse game of like who's going to be one step ahead with the prep, with the answer to the answer and so on and so forth. But Parley's unique in that theoretically we shouldn't be reading the same arguments all the time because there's different topics and, and all those kinds of things. And so I think in Parley, when teams are doing things similarly from round to round to round, or when you identify that they have a weakness, that is kind of where you should try and play against them. I think that unless you're like literally one of the best teams in the country, like let's say top three team in the country, chances are your best odds of beating someone or are dr dragging them to an area of debate where they're less comfortable and then just beating them at that style, being more prepared for it, being more experienced in it, knowing more about it, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And I think that one of the things that has made um, Brenna and Tristan relatively resilient to these things is that, you know, I was their coach, obviously, I haven't been in a long time, and so I don't want to assume they debate exclusively the same way, but they didn't have like a clear weakness because they didn't have like a clear thing that they did all the time. Like they can read the K, they can read the disad, they can read condo, they can read theory, they can go for topicality, they can go straight up abs, they can go like these squirrely abs, like all these kinds of things. And so if I had to think about it now, like how would I beat Brenna and Tristan? Uh, you think I'd reveal that? You think I would just rat out my former students? I'm not a traitor. I would never tell you how to beat them. You're gonna lose, okay? Uh, ignoring that, uh, I, I would say though, for the teams in general and all these different debate formats, um, look around you, try and figure out what other teams are doing that is successful for them, emulate those things to the degree that you can, but realize that in emulating them, it's going to be difficult to be better than them because you're just trying to be a photocopy of someone else. But instead, let's not worry about what they're amazing at. Let's worry about what their weakness seems to be. Let's figure out, let's get as much data as we can about their habits, the way they debate and the things that we can sort of exploit. And I think that um, this is how people in a lot of other competitive disciplines sort of think about things. Um, if we're talking about like mixed martial arts or something to that effect, there's a lot of, re uh, I think the Conor McGregor example is probably a really easy one. Um, Conor McGregor knocked out Jose Aldo to become the featherweight champion. He knocked him out in like 14 seconds or something. But the way he knocked him out, uh, like the exact move he did to knock this dude out, where he like stepped to the side, hit him with a specific punch in a specific place. There is footage of him backstage practicing that exact move because his coaching staff had gotten a read on this is what this dude does after a certain kind of thing. So he's going to be there. The punch will probably land. Uh, and there's a number of examples of that in MMA. I think in chess, we see similar things, right? Where people play certain kinds of lines, they're familiarized with that, and maybe there's some sort of vulnerability to be uh, exploited in those areas. Knowing a lot about your opponent and how to attack them is very important. Uh, one last example that I just saw like in the news today was like, so the White Sox are a really awful baseball team right now. But um, I think they played the Twins, if I'm not mistaken. And the Twins, statistically right now, are the worst team in all of baseball against off-speed pitches. So pitches that aren't like a, a fastball, basically. And uh, all these other teams, like 66% of the time, the pitches they throw to them are off-speed pitches because theoretically the analytics say that would work. And meanwhile, the White Sox just keep throwing fastballs and then losing. Uh, and so the bottom line is there's so many things that I see in other avenues of competition and other activities that just work and that have been tried and true and that we can probably adopt and put into debate. And one of the biggest ones is just thinking about your opponent, figuring out what their strengths are, figuring out what their weaknesses are, and then competing around that as opposed to being solely focused on you. Because yes, obviously improving your speed, improving your technique, all of those things really great gains. But once you hit a certain level, it's so hard to get better because you're already really, really good. So at that point, it does become, especially at the national championship tournament, you know the five or six teams you have to be to win nationals. Maybe there's a dark horse this year, but I feel pretty confident that the top four teams at NPDA and NPTE, obviously NPDA already happened, but like NPTE, for example, like if all these teams were there and only a few of them are, but uh, well, actually most of them are, but if Brent and Trish are there, if Rice's top team is there, if the two women teams are there, if the top Yuchi Tower team is there, those are the five teams that I'd put my money on to make it deep at that tournament. Now, I don't think Rice is there, if I'm not mistaken, and so those other teams are who I expect to make it deep into elimination rounds. And so, if you know that, have you thought about them? Have you prepared for them? Have you put in time to specifically what you expect to see from them and how they write files and how they approach the critique and theory and so on and so forth? Because if you haven't, you're probably not going to win nationals next year either. And uh, that's it. Talk to you folks later.